Good morning and welcome to another Sunday morning message from Corner Brook Baptist Church. It's a pleasure for you to be with us today, no matter which kind of media you're watching us on. This morning I want to talk to you about running out, something that we've become familiar with, and especially since there have been shortages in certain things early in this pandemic. These are strange times. We have to retrace our footsteps a long time to find a period of time when gas has been as cheap as it's been in recent weeks. But here's the weird part. Cheap fuel in the midst of a travel ban. Cheap fuel and no work. For the most of us, we're all filled up, but there's nowhere to go. People at gas stations tell me their vehicle never drops anywhere near the empty mark anymore. In this morning's message, here's a case of a couple who tried to run on empty very early in their married life. In fact, it's not gas, but wine, and the occasion is their wedding banquet. Let me read it to you from John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drew the water, drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Jesus and his band of fledgling disciples are at a wedding. It happens in an obscure little town called Cana. They knew that Jesus was different than anyone else they had ever known, but they couldn't possibly have predicted what kind of experience they would have or how anything would turn out for them in the end. They didn't know what Jesus was capable of doing, or just how his life would change theirs for time and for eternity. Now, weddings in this culture were not a hasty affair. They could have been engaged since they were children. They reviewed the guest list, determined they had everything that they needed, enough food, enough wine, plenty of space, accommodations for out-of-town guests, Every base was covered. We know this was true because it was a serious offense in these times to run out of anything. They could have ended up in court for advertising a wedding and all of the trimmings and then not being able to deliver the goods. But in any case, Jesus was there. And some scholars suggest he was a relative. But he was there as well when a murmur of dissatisfaction began to ripple through those who attended. The wine is all gone. Another whispered, we just got here. It can't be gone already. After all their planning, this was embarrassing. It was a full-blown emergency for them. They had run out. You see, life doesn't always prepare us for the emergencies. This current coronavirus is proof that the entire world was unprepared for this kind of pandemic, and in some cases is still unprepared for it. It's interesting to me that the word pandemic begins and ends with the letters that make up the word panic. The people in this story understood what the needs for a wedding were. They had a caterer, someone who was called the master of the feast. They had water pots for washing people's feet after they arrived. They had guests, they had food, they had wine. Well, at least for a while. Out of earshot, there must have been some frantic discussions. 
the searches for extra jugs of wine came up empty. Panic lurked in the weeds. Now let me point out a great truth of human life. We all start without something that is essential. Every single person begins with the deficiency, whether we're rich or poor. It may seem that we don't have a need until we run into the emergencies of life and then we realize we really don't have what it takes. There's a misleading spirit in this world that says we are self-contained and self-sufficient. It's a terrible lie. It's a delusion. It leads people into complacency and it usually only shows up when there's a full-blown emergency. Worse than that, some people live their entire lives never realizing they may be neglecting the one thing that gives us meaning in this life and hope beyond this life. Now, one of the pivotal people in this story is Mary. She saw this emergency unfold. She knew the disgrace that would fall upon this young family. Her sense of confidence in her son sent her to Jesus. Now look at her words to him again. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus was a carpenter. Why tell him? And at first he didn't respond, at least not in the way they expected. Jesus said to her, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. But Mary pressed him. She was unwilling to let the matter drop. And his mother said to the servants, here's those words again, whatever he says to you, do it. Now thank God for our first responders during emergencies. Mary was really that kind of person in this, in this story. She cared for this young couple. She offered great advice. Whatever he says to you, do it. Jesus asked something that's unusual. He asked that six water pots that had been filled earlier in the day be filled again. Roughly, some scholars say, 128 gallons of water had to be hauled from a well again. The servants might not have been pleased, but they did it. Drawing water was hard work, and they'd had a tough day already, but they did it. See, God's agenda is not always easy for us. Jesus carried a cross later in his life, was crucified between thieves, but out of his death comes our life. Bear in mind today that anything God provides will always come with an invitation for our participation. Some examples, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and it shall be given unto you. You see, even when we try and run on empty, we need to show a little initiative. Moses had to stand in front of Pharaoh and make God's request. David had to walk out and face Goliath and his brothers, not very well armed. Paul carried the gospel to the remote corners of the Roman Empire under great duress and at times immense personal cost. Grace is free, but the gospel in a way costs us. Sometimes we run on empty because we've been unwilling to fill the water pots, to do our part. But look at what happens through obedience here. The common foot washing pots were filled and in the process, something miraculous took place. The instructions were clear from Jesus. Take some of the contents of these pots, take it to the master of the feast, in some versions called the governor. It would be his decision to serve what was in those containers. Now let's stop for a second. I suppose there would be some who would be upset just by the container this liquid came of. It was a foot washing container, humble in the extreme. See, we have to be careful that God's use of the common doesn't skew our view of his power. Some of the disciples were fishermen. Some of the prophets were shepherds. God invests his resources in some of the least likely people and does his greatest miracles with common, ordinary things. I'd like to have been there when the governor of the feast took the first sip of wine. I suppose his reputation was on the line as well. He'd been part of the miscalculation, I suppose. He'd have to bear some of the blame for the feast running dry. 
but the light in his eyes beamed his unmistakable delight when he tasted it. The water had become wine, but not just any wine. It was superb, better than anything he'd tasted during this feast in backwoods Cana. He was surprised. Most feasts served the best first, and then when people showed some signs, came the in inferior vintages. This was different. The young couple who had been running on empty, along with all the close family, must have breathed a collective sigh of relief as goblets were, quick, were quickly refilled and the panic subsided. See, the lure to run on empty is part of our nature. We think we have enough to get us where we're going. It shows a deficiency in our planning or in our knowledge. But it also can show up as a presumptuous type of faith. Here's the bad news. Human beings do not have the goods to get them safely into the presence of God without some serious help. The good news, that's what the cross was all about. We didn't have enough. We didn't start with enough. But God so loved the world that he gave. Christ fills the deficiency and he's more than enough. If you read John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, the first miracle that Jesus did, and only see the physical miracle, you may miss the entire point. Jesus is really explaining the principles of the kingdom he has come to announce and establish. His point, more so, is this. Life is marked by happiness and sorrow. The wedding and the emergency. The truth is that the party and the panic may only be a heartbeat apart. The party was in full swing until the Titanic hit the iceberg, and we know that story well. Tears of joy and tears of sorrow often flow from the same eyes, only moments apart. A Jesus' miracle was a wonderful announcement. He came to turn sorrow into joy. He came to announce a kingdom with an eternal hope, a place that even when life has thrown its worst at you, the best is yet to come. You may enjoy life and its blessings, but it will pass away, as we do. Too many people only drink deeply of this world's temporary pleasures, never knowing that Christ has something better for us to experience something lasting. When life has seen its best, or when pain has plunged us into sorrow, or even when death has done its worst and left us broken, Christ's message to the humble people of Cana, and by extension to us, is that something superior is coming. Let me end with a bizarre story. As a young woman, and some of you may have heard this before, a young woman diagnosed with a terminal illness and given just three short months to live. So as she was getting her things in order, as we say, she contacted her pastor and had him come to her house to discuss certain aspects of her final wishes. She told him which song she wanted sung at the memorial service, which scriptures she wanted read, and who would be involved in it. Everything was in order, and the pastor was preparing to leave her home when the young woman suddenly remembered something very important to her. There's one more thing, she said excitedly. Watch that, was the pastor's reply. This is very important, the young woman continued. I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. The pastor stood looking at the young woman, not knowing quite what to say. That surprises you, doesn't it, the young woman asked him. Well, to be honest, I'm puzzled by the request. The pastor responded. The young woman explained in this way. My grandmother once told me this story. And from there on out, I've always done so. I have also always tried to pass this message along to those whom I love and those who are in need of encouragement. In all my years of attending church socials, she said, and many potluck dinners, I always remember that when the dishes of the main course are being cleared, someone would inevitably lean over and say, keep your fork. It was my favorite part because I knew something better was coming. The grace of God is really the intervention 
of Christ in a life that was heading for loss. You don't have to run on empty. Let him fill your life with forgiveness, with peace, and with eternal hope. He's what's coming, and he's what's superior. Something better, no, I guess it should be someone better, has come and provided a way that we can enjoy his fullness. Christ is our fullness and our hope. Let me pray with you as we close today. Father, thank you for an opportunity once again to reach out by extension to those who will tune in to one of the various media and listen. So no matter what platform people are on today, we thank you for the technology that exists to do this. We thank you for this wonderful example from Scripture and pray now that someone will be encouraged by this message from John chapter 2, that someone for whom life has been sorrowful, someone who has been broken, will remember that with Christ in our lives, the best is yet to come. And so we ask your blessing upon them and upon all of us as we reach out to pass this message on to others. We bless you and thank you. In Christ's name, amen.